But now I don't see those gobbles and cubs. I don't hear the blues anymore. Rough Trade is giving away a third off the first three months of the Rough Trade Club plus new music membership exclusively to 101 Part Time Jobs listeners. Become a member of Rough Trade Club New Music and you'll receive the Rough Trade Album of the Month straight to your door every month on exclusive vinyl pressing with exclusive bonus material. Club members have received exclusive pressings of albums from Sufjan Stevens, Sprints, The Last Dinner Party, Julie Byrne, and Over Mono, just to name a few. This part year alone sign up using the promo code club 101 pod and you'll get the rough trade album of the month english teachers excellent debut album this could be texas on exclusive galaxy gold for a third of the usual price here's english teacher on a recent episode of 101 how many opportunities do you get to write a debut album and have and have all of this you know support behind us i don't know i really like the idea of holding the bar as being like classic songs now you only get one shot at a debut <laughs> Don't want the album of the month but still want all the benefits? Sign up to the standard tier using Club 101 Pod and you'll still get the first month free. You'll also get free shipping on all orders, 10% off the bar and on secondhand vinyl in store and exclusive access to sold out Rough Trade events. So don't hang around. Go to roughtrade.com slash club and sign up with the code club 101 pod. That's club 101 pod and claim money off the album of the month English teachers, this could be Texas. Today, this offer is available to UK residents only. Do you play in bands? I did for the longest time. And I wish that I knew that DistroKid was a thing. I don't even think it existed back then. DistroKid makes music distribution fun and easy with unlimited uploads and artists keep 100% of your royalties and earnings. A million plus artists rely on DistroKid to get their music on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, TikTok, Tidal, Instagram, and all the major streaming services. When you get DistroKid, you can see a DistroKid bank and withdraw your earnings. You get notified when you've earned royalties and you can withdraw via the app. And you can even check your streaming stats on Spotify Spotify and Apple. Get 30% off your first year on DistroKid by going to distrokid.com slash VIP slash 101 pod. 30% off for your first year. That's not bad. We know it's a tough world out there. Why don't you make it easier for yourself? And to get 30% off that free year as an artist where you get 100% of your royalties and earnings, go to distrokid.com slash VIP slash 101 pod. All right, stay with me. I'll be right back after this. This episode is brought to you by Bumble. So you want to find someone you're compatible with, specifically someone who's ready for a serious connection, totally open to having kids in the future, is a tall rock climbing Libra, and loves rom-coms with vegan pizzas on Tuesdays just as much as you do. Bumble knows that you know exactly what's right for you. So whatever it is you're looking for, Bumble's features can help you find it. Date now on Bumble. It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper, a woo a hand clapper, a high-fiver? I kind of like the high-five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At ChumbaCasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino-style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses, so don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VGW group. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. Hello, you're listening to 101 Part-Time Jobs, the podcast where I, Giles Bidder, speak to bands about their stories behind the music, how they've made it work in a world, in an industry that, let's face it, is pretty difficult to stay on top of. Dell Water Gap has released some epic tunes in the lead up to his album i miss you and i haven't left yet it features arlo parks and claro the videos are so cinematic and dell or holden for the sake of this has got a real style to it he's got a real worker's ethic to what he puts into it so he's perfect for this chat i really love chatting with him and i hope you enjoy these stories too he's just announced a uk tour next year in january and over the next few months up and until right to the end of November, he's touring all across the States. So that's your chance to see him. 
Thank you so much for listening to 101 Part-Time Jobs. If you enjoy this episode, if you enjoy this show, please leave a rating or a review. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, you can subscribe. When you subscribe, that helps me so much to keep getting brilliant and brilliant guests, just like Holden on here. I've also started a newsletter called P45 RPMs that are going out on Sundays. I always need something to read on a Sunday morning. So P45 RPMs is the newsletter where I talk about what's coming up on the show as well as some personal stories. On last week's P45, I talked about how I found myself in Boston, Massachusetts, trying to get a scoop on Leonardo DiCaprio. You can find that at 101parttimejobs.com where you can sign up just with your email address and you'll get some good stuff coming through on Sundays. Before we get into this chat, I'm here with Rebecca from Eka, multi-instrumentalist, plays piano, plays saxophone, also a brand ambassador for Ampolo, which is a great brand new free app for musicians. All right, Rebecca, could you tell us a little bit about Ampolo? Yeah, I've been using um, Ampolo, which is an app that came out earlier this year, actually. Smart with its AI demixing tools. So in under a minute, it will completely demix a track which means I can take out the drums, the bass, vocals, whatever it is I want to be trying my own part over. Whereas before, I would be Googling chords and then on YouTube Googling the song and kind of flicking between the tabs while setting up my instrument and trying to practice along, it all happens in the app. Then yeah, and then I'm posting it to a feed if I want that social aspect of it, but I don't have to. Like I've been spending many hours just practicing parts and thinking, wow, this is so easy, you know, play again and again to make sure I nail that bit. So it's a practice tool, you can film yourself, it's free, it's out there, and Polo. You can download it today. All right, here's Holden, AKA Del Water Gap. His new album, I Miss You and I Haven't Left Yet, is out this Friday. Here he is on 101 Part-Time Jobs. 101 Part-Time Jobs. I'm lucky enough to not have to work jobs anymore, but um, I spent a lot of years in New York City sort of kicking around. And um, I was working some jobs. I was catering. I was helping some old ladies set up their printers and their Wi-Fi. And um, I I really associate with what you were saying about... (laughs) sort of blowing things up at the pizza delivery job or whatever it was that you said, you know, this feeling of like I would book a tour and I'd be like, fuck y'all, I'm out, you know, and sort of, you know, you, you imagine yourself throwing the proverbial pizza box up in the air and walking out. And then, and then, you know, reality hits when you come back and you're like, man, like we're still here, you know? And, and, and that's, that's sort of like the plight of the artist. I think regardless of your level of success, so much of surviving this job and this career is being able to ride those those peaks and valleys, right? Whether it's financial, whether it's ego, whether it's like adrenaline, whether it's fame, whatever, you know, there's always moments when your pendulum is swinging one way and then it comes back. And and when you're down, you never think you're going to be up. When you're up, you never think you're going to be down. And then, you know, a lot of life is the life that happens between, you know, memories. You know, so much of being a musician and so much of being a human being is waiting right and sitting you know whether that's sitting in the green room waiting for the show whether that's waiting for your coffee whether that's waiting for the train um and that stuff like you know that's sort of like the stuff of life that's like learning to be with yourself and learning to uh learning to try to be present in those moments in between so i i think i think my long answer is that like this sort of pendulum of a life that i think is all of our experience as people in society, but it's, I think the volume on that has turned up quite a bit as a performer and as an artist. What do you think has helped you get through that time? What's been your like happy place or your happy thought, or, you know, it could be like a routine. I mean, for me, like if I'm, a, it's, it's just, it's so ridiculous, isn't it? But if I'm feeling a bit like, if I wake up and I'm a bit like, damn, you know, I'll just go somewhere. I haven't been to coffee before and I'll get an iced coffee from somewhere. You know, it's kind of the small things. Yeah. I mean, it, it's funny you mentioned that. It's funny you mentioned that because I literally did that before this meeting. I, 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 I came off, um, you know, basically two years of touring that I'm, I'm still really in, I'm not really off tour, but, um, I came off, uh, my first Australian tour, which was amazing, but, you know, very athletically challenging. We slept very little and had a flight every day and it was, it was amazing, but it, it, it really, uh, it really burned me out. And then I 
you know, was straight into some family action and then straight into um, going on tour with a friend um, and, and then came back here. And I, I was really f- like starting to feel like deep, deep, deep burnout for the first time. You know, I'm, I'm sure you've been there where you're starting to resent like literally everything. You know, every ounce of work, you're starting to resent your laundry, you're resenting your friends, you're resenting the people that are trying to ask you how you are. It's like a don't touch me moment. Oh my God, exactly. Yeah. You know, you feel like a toddler, uh, like having a meltdown. And I, I had dinner with a with my best friend's mom who, um, she lives in Hawaii, but but she was over here in Los Angeles. And, you know, she was like, how are you really doing? And we were at, a, we were at dinner at Italian, you know, and I started bawling at dinner, like into my pasta. And wow. <laughs> this is like only about two weeks ago. And um she, she was just talking about that. She was talking about sort of the cumulative effect of being the type of person that does nice things for yourself. She's like, you know, I think in, I think in this sort of mindful world that we live in now where mindfulness is so talked about and so commercialized, you know, there's this notion that like, you're feeling anxious, go on a walk and you'll feel better. She was like, that's the wrong way to think about it. She says... Going on a walk may, may not make you feel better, but the cumulative effect of being the type of person that allows yourself to go on a walk in the middle of the day, like that is what will make you feel better. Mm. She was like, being the type of person that allows yourself to like buy yourself flowers to have in your, your house, being the type of person that allows yourself to wander and to go to that new coffee shop and to not check your phone until you've been awake for two hours, you know? Mm. And, and a lot of this stuff like that I'm talking about is of course like a luxury and that comes from a place of privilege of being able to do those things and take that time and maybe not check your phone. But when I look at like the way that my life is right now as a touring musician, someone who basically makes my own schedule when I'm not on tour, um, that that's sort of my project right now. And so this morning, for example, I just, I just bought myself an alarm clock so I don't have to look <laughs> at my phone and use my phone yeah. as an alarm clock. And so I went to this new coffee shop down the street and I read the New Yorker for like 30 minutes and then uh, came back here to do this chat. You know, it's, so. it feels like sometimes it's too late to do something like that. It's too late to pick up that newspaper that you've never read before or haven't since you were a kid. Totally. totally. I mean, the piles of New Yorkers that I have in my apartment and I just... I vacillate between holding on to them because I'll read them someday and throwing them out, even though I've never opened them. And it's this great, like my, my, my New Yorkers come to represent, you know, the other things in my life, the clutter in my life, the social media obsession. Did you have, um, I mean, I like the, the answer is probably yes, but I mean, did you have that kind of journey from being a teenager writing songs? I know you went to school to study music in New York was that was that kind of a long kind of slow perhaps arduous process of being that person who's really keen on music and you're like you know I enjoy doing this and it feels me to hitting that point where you identify with being a a musician I think that that's like a big mm-hmm. part of this podcast big part of this conversation is like being able to kind of look in the mirror and being like yeah that's me I don't need to hide it from myself or anyone else anymore. Yeah. I mean, I, once again, I think that's, that's one of the hardest parts about coming into being an artist or a professional artist as a young person is, is, is like allowing yourself to wear the, wear the badge. Right. Mm. It's like, you know, if you're a doctor or you're a lawyer or whatever, you go to four or five years of school, mm. one day you're a doctor or sorry, one day you're not a doctor. And the next day you are officially a doctor yeah. and you have that title and, and, um, you know, being an artist, like you, you only are what you say you are, you are what you say when you look in the mirror and when you introduce yourself. And, um, you know, I think, like you said, I, you know, I, I moved from a small town, I moved to New York to, to study music. And for me, the, the skirting of that title came in many forms. I think for a while I told people I was a producer that had an artist project you know, mm. I'm not really an artist. I'm, I'm a producer, but yeah, I have this artist project called Delwater Gap. And I think, um, the other way that I would do it was I would say, yeah, like I go to music school, but I don't know that I'm going to like do music forever. Yeah. And, and that was in retrospect, you know, that came from a place of fear, of course, and insecurity and, and fear of being let down. And, and also my parents are, I come from a family of, of like, a very type A people of academics. And so I think like my, my, my programming growing up was very much um, one in which like 
being an artist couldn't be a serious career or a way to make a living. And, right. and yeah, and I, I think once again, like to use the early analogy, I think it's a bit of a pendulum. I think that now I look in the mirror and like, I am a working artist. Like I've been doing this for years. It is my job. Like it's every hour of my day is like either making music or doing something that has to do with my music. But yeah, I mean, there's days and weeks and months when I really feel like I'm faking it <laughs> and maybe that never goes away. And I think that that can apply to anything. I'm sure that applies to people that are, you know, like parents, you know, yeah. it's like, man, I'm not a parent. Like I'm, I'm faking it. Yeah. Like who gave me this kid, you know, or, or, you know, I, I, I don't know, but, but I think to your point, it's a bit of a practice. I'm, I'm trying to get better at just like talking to myself, you know, when no one's around. We talk about accumulative effects and yeah, you know, say someone who becomes a doctor and like a lot of times, I mean, I've always been the kind of person that I kind of see myself the way my friends see me. You know, if my friends laugh at my joke, I think I'm funny. If my friends think I'm being rude, totally. I'm like, oh damn, I'm rude. I've got to check myself. In that sort of social environment, when you meet someone or you meet a friend of a friend and you're like, oh, you know, what do you do? Oh, I'm a doctor. And you don't, they don't need to say any more than that for you to let your imagination run wild and be like, oh, you're this hugely successful person. And if you say, oh, I'm, I'm an artist, that that's, you kind of end up kind of like rolling into some kind of, but this, but this, and this, and maybe this. Exactly. And I think the thing is like with, with artists, it's, it's a work in progress. Like part of the definition of being an artist is a work in progress, but so is every other profession, but it's just, it's just nice totally. and neat, you know, it's nice and neat. And totally. we just choose to not ask any further questions. Like, look, if you're a fucking doctor, you are going to be a much better doctor 15 years from now than you are today. And you're going to be making mistakes. <laughs> They're really painful mistakes in the next few years. Painful mistake. I mean, I, I, I think that's such a funny, yeah. I love the idea of someone being like, yeah, I'm a doctor, but you know, I, I, I really, I really love, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like kind of a doctor, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I have this other thing that I do, but yeah, I'm a doctor. <laughs> I'm going to make some mistakes. I'm going to like, you know, ruin someone's body a little bit, but you know, it's part of it. Yeah. <laughs> you, don't, you don't hear it, do you? Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. And, and something someone said to me recently is like, you know, words cast spells, which I've really been thinking about, right. you know, like you, you sort of create your reality by how you talk about your reality. So, you know, if someone, if you're, if you're walking around telling people that you're a fucking artist, yeah. you know, and a musician, it, it's probably going to make you move through the world differently. And then that, you know, that movement is going to manifest into something real, something more real, maybe. I mean, that is a huge part of relationships. You know, I think that's why um, toxic relationships, painful relationships, controlling relationships, that's how they come to be because people believe the way that someone's talking to them or, you know, I'll believe this way that someone's spoken to me or they'll believe of the way uh, because I've spoken to them in that way. You believe that. And I'm, and what you say about losing you, which just came out and is such a fine song. It's, it's so fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And what you say about it, about being scared and in that moment being a bit like, Oh, I can't get that thing out of my head. And, and then kind of gaining a bit of distance on it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a really interesting way. Not everyone really has to do that in their life, you know, and mm -hmm. being able to do that yeah. and being able to put that into words that kind of, that satisfies quite a few kind of emotional feelings as an artist, you're putting that, you're getting that off your chest as a listener. We're like, Oh, okay. It is okay to do that. It is okay to be like, Oh mm -hmm. yeah, actually. Okay. We need to get some distance on that. Do you think that you've been able right. to work through what's your journey been like of like working through your own emotions, your own pitfalls, your own, you know, good sides of or through your music. Is that something that you've had to think like long and hard about? Yeah, it's a good question. I think a bit of it's like, it's a bit chicken and egg, right? Mm. Because I think that writing music has allowed me to become more self-aware and have more self-knowledge. Um, but also as I've gained more self-awareness and self-knowledge and moved through life, I think that my songs have just gotten better, you know, and more confessional and more real and less performative in a sense. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think this album in particular, um, I really wrote in between tremendous amounts of movement and transience. I mean, like I said, I've been touring for a few years and this album happened in these 
these very quick blocks at home, um, you know, it, it was like, you know, my first album came out and I toured, I was supposed to tour for like a week and it ended up, you know, going on for years, which was amazing. But when it came to having to start making a second album, it was like, when is this going to happen? Right? Like, I don't have time to do my laundry. So, so this album really became um, a product of those time, you know, that time in between different continents and states and countries and everything. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I find tour is a bit of like, you know, you're a bit in survival mode, as I'm sure you know, like you're just trying to like get to where you need to be and you need to eat mm. and you need to sleep. And so, yeah, you know, the album became a real, um, a real, you know, space of, of, of quiet and stillness amidst all the transients to like sort of pop the periscope up and look around yeah. and say like, where am I and what, what have I done and what has happened to what is happening in my life and in my relationships. And, um, and yeah, I, I, I think in a way that's like, uh, you know, that's, that's sort of the dream as a creator to make something that feels like a real representation of your experience. Um, Being able to find some time and like headspace to do that is pretty unreal. I mean, you have, you have to kind of, well, I moved it when I like during the height of my band touring, I moved into a house with eight friends who are all like <laughs> partying and people, yeah. there was like 12 people there at any one time. And, and I was like, Oh, this is what I should be doing. But I didn't write one song totally. when I was there because I didn't have any headspace. When you're traveling, could you, could you get time to just give yourself some peace and quiet to write down that lyric, to, to play guitar, to get mm -hmm. on your laptop and work around with it? With, could you afford to give yourself that time? I, you know, honestly, no. And I, I don't know how much of that I, I, I have been really hard on myself about it. And I think I had initially thought that there was something wrong with me. And then I started talking to more musicians and they were like, yeah, it's really hard to write on tour. Mm. It's really hard to find space on tour. And um, I, you know, I had been touring in such a way that I think made it particularly hard. You know, I was in a transit for a few months and then I was in a sprinter for a few months and Early on, I was helping with the driving and um, luckily I, you know, I'm lucky enough to have a bus starting in this fall, which will, you know, I have faith that that will really just change the answer to your question, right? Yeah, like yeah. being able to actually sleep and have some time. And um, I have trouble writing if my basic needs aren't taken care of. And, yeah. and I don't know if that makes me like a wimp or whatever, but like, I need to sleep and I need to like have some alone time and I need to have some stillness and I need to be able to do what I did this morning and like go sit somewhere. Yeah. And, um, it's really hard for me to write like in between things and, and um, I don't know, I'm just sensitive. Like we're all sensitive, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to jump back and forth between like a call with your lawyer, writing your album and then going out to dinner with friends, you know, like it's, you need a little bit of space. You know, I was just talking to the kid who did my album with me, Sammy, like he was talking about this cause he's a very successful producer. And I was like, H you know, how are you feeling? And he was like, you know, I'm, I I'm, I'm starting to lean into this idea that like, it's just, it takes me like hours to get into making music. And he's like, you know, I'll get into the studio at like 10 or 11, I'll make coffee. And he's like, my ideas will be shit until like four or 5 PM. And I'm beating myself up and I'm sitting there all day hating myself. And then, you know, but I know that if I just like hang in and mm. I give myself that space and that time and that stillness and I give myself permission to just like mm. get bored and play around, like something will happen. And I, I think that's it. I think he said it very well, you know, like that you, you just kind of need that space to run a bit and wander and then yeah. great things can happen. You know, like p p people have always said like, you know, great creativity comes out of great boredom. I think it's true. <laughs> like you can't, I mean, think about kids, like, you know, like, I feel like maybe at least like pre-internet, pre like tablet era, like when I was growing up, you know, I was so fucking bored all the time. I grew up in the woods and we didn't really have internet. I didn't really have TV and I'm very happy for that. You know, it made me have an imagination. And You start BMXing, like, building tree houses, building skate ramps. Yeah. Like playing with Legos and drawing and all this stuff that I did because I was like, there's no one around. I don't have neighbors. I don't like my parents are busy. Like my brother's doing whatever. You know, you know what you're talking about earlier about calling a lawyer and then doing this and doing that. I mean, that is the 101 part-time jobs of it. All of that stuff is in your remit. I mean, and accepting that it takes you or your producer mate 
eight hours or six hours to start writing. It's almost like when you accept that you start, you stop feeling shit about it because you don't need to feel shit about it. Really? Anything that you're making, everything that anything that's making you feel bad is taking away from what you're trying to do. So accepting that's the way you work. That's part of it. It's, yeah. And it's, it's also like, it's hard. It's a, it's hard being a writer. You know, if it was easy, everyone would do it. You know, it's really hard. It's, it's hard spending a lot of time alone and it's hard pulling shit out of the air. And, um, it's okay, you know, but yeah, you're right. I, I, you know, I think it's a life work to try to, it's a life's work to try to deconstruct some of that shame, mm. at least for me, you know, once again, just having grown up and my parents are incredibly loving and supportive, but the way that I was taught to think about the world, was this very sort of like quantifiable progress mentality, mm. right. Of mm. like, you finish college and you get your, your degree and you get your next degree and then you get the job and you get this and you get that. And I think that's a lovely way to go through life. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, like I would have been happier had I chosen that path, but, um, but this is like, this is my life and it's a life of meaning and it's one that right now I'm choosing. And, um, you know, we're, 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 we are all, we are all sort of products of our upbringing and what we inherit from our parents or our caregivers, right? Mm -hmm. Like we spend our adult life negotiating with that and trying to either unlearn that or metabolize it. And, um, this specific thing that you're talking about is, is, is a big part of my metabolization as far as how I was raised to think about the world and like one's path through life. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it, it's constant for me. Yeah. Switch, you know, changing up those kind of footprints in the snow, if you like of your mind, you know, you keep on going to the same footprints cause that's what you were taught. That's what you learned. I mean, what, how um how has meeting other musicians changed your life i mean look this record has got claro and arlo parks on it two songwriters who you know you i feel like maybe it's always been this way maybe it's just the kind of way we're getting older and i'm reading more you know longer reads of music magazines and music websites but this kind of transparency of of songwriters working together is so much more uh, like open, freely available, this kind of information, you know, it kind of, mm -hmm. I feel like I definitely read that Claro and Arlo Parks have both been in this kind of ecosystem of songwriters. And mm -hmm. I imagine you are too. Yeah. I mean, I, I think uh, feeling like an artist and calling yourself an artist and believing that I think like community is such a important factor in 100%. that. Right. It's like, like, I think we are, a lot of artists, you know, a lot of musicians in particular, I think we're only as good as the community that we're in because it just, it's a mirror, right? If I'm obsessed with someone's music and they know me and they like me and they like my music, like that's going to give me a certain level of like understanding maybe mm -hmm. or contextualize the work that I'm making that it is so hard to have a, have a, a window into. Um, it's just like, you know, when you're younger or you did good at something and go, someone giving you like a pat on the back, pat on the shoulder. Yeah. You're like, go on kid. Yeah, totally. Totally. It's such a great compliment. I mean, having like a stranger and a fan love your music is obviously like the highest compliment, but it's a really different feeling to have someone that you, whose work you love and respect be like, I see you. Mm. I love what you're doing. Mm. Have you had many of these kinds of sort of lifestyle, I suppose? That sounds a bit dry, doesn't it, lifestyle? But do you find you have many, many, like having many of these conversations with, with fellow songwriters, with people you're hanging out with? Oh, yeah, all the time. And I, it's funny, but it's, it's mostly what I talk about. And I think that I've really been actively trying to meet people who are not in music. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Like I, you know, I call them muggles. Cause I'm just like, <laughs> I need more friends that are like in real estate. And some of my best friends are my, my two best guy friends are, you know, one works at Google and one, you know, works in, in restaurants. And, um, I've recently met a group of, of friends from Laguna who are like, yeah, they're all like doing real estate and they're doing this stuff. And I find it incredibly, uh, incredibly relieving. Um, I love having these conversations, but I think it, it can start to feel like the whole world, um, and, and, um, yeah. And it, you know, it's funny, like we, I, I think, I don't know if this is entertainment or if this is like LA or whatever it is. And I don't know if you, you experienced this in, in London, but like, I think people are very careful about being honest about how they feel about their careers or where they are or how they feel about this sort of like deeper level stuff. Mm -hmm. Because I think that, um, I have experienced that, you know, 
I, I think I think everyone's very careful about showing like the chinks in their armor. And yeah. I think people people are more likely to tell you that everything's going great and they're feeling great. I think people are scared to get fired. People are scared to be fired, especially yeah. if you're in your first 10, 15 years of the career. I remember a friend's dad told us that once. He was like, oh, you guys are still in the stage where you think you're getting fired all the time. <laughs> and I was like, fuck, I was like, you hit the nail on the head. Fuck, this is annoying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, it's always super cool to, you know, be able to sort of go there with someone and be like, no, I mean, this is great, but it's also complicated yeah. as everything is, you yeah. know, it's like, you gotta be able to talk about it. Those friends are quite ambitious, are they? Yeah. I mean, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I don't know. It's also great. Like, it's also great to have, to, to be able to have this sort of like mutual wonderment and mutual respect yeah. and say like, I don't really know what you do, but it's cool. <laughs> and then they can look at me and be like. So, like, what is it? What does it mean to like write together? Like, you know, like you know, I haven't really thought about it. Like, what does it mean to write together? You know, I guess we sort of sit around and make noises, and then eventually it comes out. You know, <laughs> what was it like moving? I'm sure you've spoken about this a lot. So, sorry for you know asking you about it here, but moving from New York and the East Coast to LA, I mean, what was the um, you know tell me tell me like the thought process of that? Was it was it always going to happen? Being a songwriter, being in music. Yeah, you know, I I think at the time I didn't know that it was always going to happen. I think I felt very like gung ho New York, but um, in retrospect, it's so obvious. You know, I moved, I moved, I was in New York before the pandemic, and then I, I went to a friend's house in Maine, in rural Maine, when the pandemic hit, thinking you know I'd be there for two weeks, wow. ride it out, have some drinks, take a walk on the beach, and obviously, you know, I I lived there for seven months, eight months. <laughs> And in that time, I got out of my lease in New York City, and um, another friend of mine had a house in LA and was like, you know, come to LA, see how it feels. Like you can live in this house, mm. stay there for a couple months, go back to New York. So um, I was like, great, sounds good. So I go to LA, and and then right around then, my career started to change. I got um, I got new management. I signed a record deal and some of my songs were starting to sort of reach more people online. And, and then, you know, I ended up getting a sublet and I was living out in Los Feliz. And then all of a sudden I owned a car and then I was like, Oh, I guess I live in LA now. <laughs> you know, like I have a car here. And so it, it very much happened um, accidentally, but I, I think that's how a lot of people end up, you know, moving to LA or moving anywhere. You know, a lot of it can just sort of happen to you. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's been great. You know, I miss the East Coast and I spend a lot of my time touring. I don't know that I've had a lot of time to really like put roots down in LA, but um, the most positive part about moving to LA is getting to actually meet some of these people, these artists and creators that I was able to connect with during COVID online. Um, my my music, you know, the, this sort of early loudspeaker for my music um, during the pandemic was a video that um, this actress Margaret Qualley posted yeah, of, you know, her basically and her friend, another actress, Caitlin Deaver dancing to a song of mine. Yeah. And I mean, and it was like a completely random, I mean, the song had come out and no one knew it, you know, it, it hadn't really gotten plays and, and they posted this video of them during the pandemic and it just like brought all of these people to the song. And then, um, you know, a lot of other people sort of in, in Hollywood and in LA started, started finding my music and, and, um, reaching out to me and it was tremendously exciting, but, but then actually getting to LA and getting to meet some of those people and, and meet some of the musicians that I had really admired in person and talked to online. I mean, Arlo being one of them, you know, Issa, Arlo Parks, we met on Instagram and, you know, we were passing like voice messages or audio messages for like almost a year. Nice. And then I moved to LA and she was here and we ended up, you know, hanging and having dinner and, and, um, you know, I've had sort of versions of that happen a lot over the last couple of years. So LA really does feel in a way like this great, like artist summer camp, you know, there's, there's like people, if they don't live here or they're at least here a couple months out of the year. And so it's been a tremendous opportunity to just meet people and mix ideas and, and all that. We live in a time where, ostensibly like a, a, you sign to, you know, the bigger record labels are hoping their artists get TikTok hits. And, 
you know, in the picture, I mean, I'm not sure if you saw, but earlier this week, uh, A&R of the big record label or an executives of the big record labels were saying it's quote unquote depressing and they're worried for their jobs. It's like no shit because it hasn't really been like a, a like a, a healthy ecosystem for forever. Um, but yeah. when, when that stuff happened and, and basically, you, you know, you went viral of that early song of yours, how quickly did you see, like, what were the, like on the ground, you know, I'm talking management deals, people getting in touch about shows, how, what was the result of that? Did you see mm -hmm. like a, like a result of that, of that virality in itself? Yeah. I mean, it was interesting because it, you know, I didn't see the typical result, which I think a lot of people see. There was something that felt a, a bit more like groundswell and human and organic about it in a way that I've only realized in the last, you know, looking back a few years, which is that um, I had actually just started working with my new management like two weeks earlier. And they had basically, you know, this song had come out on Atlantic Records and basically failed. I mean, it, you know, it just, it didn't do well. The song did not do well. And I had sort of moved on and, and, um, you know, like, frankly, I had really been thinking about quitting music and stepping away from music. You know, it was like the height of the pandemic. I'd had a bunch of tours cancel. Things were just not looking good. Mm -hmm. And I met this manager and he was like, let's just like give this another push. Like this song is great. You have some great demos. You know, these demos became my first album. He was like, let's just like see this through with me for a few months. Like, let's just see what happens, you know? Um, and I, you know, I was, I was really not feeling good about continuing, you know, I was having like a lot of mental health problems and I was drinking a lot. And I was just like, this is my sign, like no more music. I need to just like take a step back and like probably do a different career or at least just take, take a lot of time off. Mm. So that was the context. And I had been like fully off Instagram and I was just like taking a step back and I was, you know, lying on the floor of my parents' house with my brother and we're watching Wolf of Wall Street. And my friend Gabe, who produced the song with me, kept texting me being like, check Instagram, check Instagram, check Instagram. And I was just like, no, like it, I thought it was like a meme that he had sent me. I was just like, I don't, he's like, no, no, seriously, like check Instagram. So I checked Instagram and I saw this and I was like, oh, this is cool, you know? Mm. But, you know, as someone who was feeling a bit like heartbroken about, you know, my art, I, I was just like, I'm not going to like take this too seriously. This is just like a cool thing. Mm. But what it did was it, it sort of like galvanized this very strong but quiet fan base I already had, which I didn't know that I had. So all of a sudden these people were coming out of the woodwork being like, I thought no one knew this guy. Like this was like my best kept secret. Yeah. And now people know this. And it, it like really, it really like turned on this yeah this whole base of people that i guess had been there and i just couldn't see or maybe i was too cynical to see and then and then um you know the, the i guess the main quantifiable like uh you know needle moving moment from that was that um we got some press like that event got some press they wrote about it and mm. I think it was vogue or something and then um, you know, it was early enough in the pandemic that it was sort of novel. Yeah. You know, there is this, yeah. oh, this is how young Hollywood is is getting through the pandemic. And it was right. this nice story about these these two friends sort of bonding. Um, and that's not a bad crowd to and, get into because if it's like the Vogue, no, it was not a bad crowd. GQ, these are people who buy luxury watches. They'll come to your show and buy your stuff. <laughs> right. Well, hopefully they'll buy some vinyl. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I should say the video was sort of this split screen of the two of them dancing. Yeah. And the caption was socially distanced dance party. So it was it's very sweet, like organic. It was just like a every real moment. And then and then um my manager at the time, my manager who's still my manager, Carson, he he was able to take all of this sort of groundswell and he 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 basically went and sort of repitched the song. So he okay. was able to be like Spotify. You know, you might have missed this song when it came out, yeah. but, you know, people are, this is happening organically. And then, so, w you know, when, when that happened, they were able to sort of program it and playlist it. And then that, of course, like helped it grow more. And then, um, Smart. and then, and then, yeah, just, it's, it was just like a loudspeaker. I was able to get a, a, a couple good, like touring slots off of it. You know, I, I ended up opening for Holly Humberstone and Jeremy Zucker and Girl in Red. And like, it was just like more musicians finding out about my music and then, um, and then that, I guess that, so that was over the summer. And then that January, um, 
I started talking to labels because I was like, I have all these demos, I should make an album. And, and so, yeah, I mean, it was a very sort of slow, organic, but controllable builds. And, um, Great. and yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's turned into like being able to make more songs and yeah. continue and play shows. So. Well, the singles off the record, I miss you already. And I haven't left yet. They, they just, they're so great. And the videos are so cinematic. They're really like a pleasure to watch. You. And, you know, everyone listening to this and myself, so glad something like that and other spinning plates of your career, you know, could come together so you could keep on doing it. Cause like, that's the thing of this whole conversation really comes down to like, just keeping on doing it. Right. Keep, keeping on doing it. And, and I was with a friend last night, we saw Oppenheimer and I asked him, I asked him this question. I was like, what do you, you know, what are your goals? What do you want to do? And he was just like, I just want to, I just want things to keep growing. Like, I just don't want to stagnate and I don't want to downscale. Yeah. Right. And I think that's sort of where I am. Like, I just want to be able to continue to make music that inspires me. And, uh, you know, I would like to keep continuing to tour and getting to do that in a way that feels increasingly more comfortable yeah. and yeah. more sort of like balanced with regard to life. Yeah. Um, you won't be banging your knees yeah. in the transit van. You'll be sitting on the bus with <laughs> as much knee space as you like. That's right. <laughs> 101, 101, part-time jobs. 101, 101, 101, part-time jobs. It's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price. Priceline. Hey, this has been great. Thank you so much for being up for this. Let's let's finish off with, I like hearing kind of fail stories from old jobs. And I don't know exactly <laughs> like how many teenage jobs you've had, but I mean, what, what, what have you been like in terms of like getting pushed out the door by your parents? Uh, did you have the kind of parents that showed you the, uh, like the work hard, play hard ethics growing up? <laughs> I mean, it's funny, you know, they're, like I said, they were incredibly loving, but you know, they're just like a bit, um, you know, mystified by, by, by what I wanted to do. You know, I was like kind of a weird kid. Um, I think like my, my like fail stories were, you know, all of my good fail stories, I think happened when I was already out of their, out of their nest, yeah. you know? So I was like, uh, living in New York city, you know, when I was coming out of, yeah, when I was in New York and I think like, I mean, there's so many that come to mind. Um, and New York's an unforgiving place to live, right? <laughs> yeah, it really is. I mean, I don't know if this is a fail on my part or on the part with the person I was working for, but I, I had this job for a bit that was, um, it was a great job. I was setting up, it was like a luxury photo booth company. So they would, um, they would, you know, you could rent a photo booth for like $4,000 and it would, you know, you could get this photo booth at your party mm. and sort of these like beautiful, I mean, I'm sure you've seen them, you know, they have them at weddings, they have them at like corporate parties, whatever. So I worked for them and I was sort of the guy that would show up to the party with a photo booth and set it up and make sure the printer was working and help people. And um, I had this one night where I was, I was doing a birthday party for this influencer who will remain unnamed. And we went, um, she's this big like fashion influencer and, and they had me go to this really nice restaurant in New York, you know, it was like Carbone or something. And, and they were like, okay, like, it, you know, she had this private room in the back of the restaurant and it was like 15 of her friends and it was beautiful and they're all dressed up. And they were like, okay, set up the photo booth in the corner and like, we're going to be having dinner and having drinks and like people can come over and take photos. And I was like, great, easy. So I set it all up and, um, I hadn't interacted with, with the birthday girl yet, but she came over and she was like, this is it. Like, this is the photo booth. And, you know, she obviously was not happy with that. And I was like, yeah, like this is the photo booth. And she was like, I paid like X amount of money to have this like piece of shit in the corner. And I was like, yeah, like, I'm sorry. Like this is, this is what it is. And so she takes a photo and she's like, man, this looks terrible. Like, you know, I was just like, 
you know, trying to do my best like PR voice and just like stay in and keep her calm. I'm thinking of the photo she goes, of her okay. just with such like a, a, a stern face. <laughs> oh my God, just with rage. She was like, okay, like this isn't going to work. And I was like, all right, well, what do you want me to do? And she goes, I want you to break down the photo booth, pack it all up, put it in the corner. And I want you to stand there next to it for the whole night. And I don't want you to leave. Like you're not allowed to leave. What? Like I've paid for you to be here. <laughs> it's like, I've paid for you to be here. So I want you to be here. Wow. So, um, I don't know. I guess a more mature, better version of me probably would have, uh, would have, would have like walked the fuck out. But yeah, I will never forget that night. I was just sitting there, you know, and I was like, man, what is my life? (laughs) Getting paid 35 an hour to just sort of sit there and lean on the wall and watch these girls have dinner. And it was such an interesting, I mean, I'll never forget it. It was such an interesting, uh, chapter in my life and it came to represent a lot. And I still think about it when I'm, you know, when I'm, when I'm on tour and stuff like, man, that was a funny, uh, that was a funny moment, and I hope that I never treat someone that way. Well, that's know? the most yeah. you'll get paid for sitting around in a corner leaning on a wall. I mean, good on you for yeah. staying, because then at least you got the money, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Hey, I've, I've got to ask, I've seen a couple of interviews. I think it was in your Brooklyn apartment, and you had some artwork behind you there. You've got some nice artwork behind you there. Have you? Are you an artist? Do you draw? Do you paint? You know, I draw a little bit. I, I, I signed up for a drawing class with the Jewish Museum in New York during during the pandemic. It was like a Zoom art class. And, you know, I paid paid some money and I get on the class and I was <laughs> I was like the only person in the class under the age of like 95. You know, it was so funny. I get on there. I'm like, oh, this is like a geriatric art class. I had no idea. But of course, it is, cause it's like the Jewish Museum on the Upper East Side. And, you know, the, the, the moderator for the class is like a 25 year old art student and she's messaging me on the side being like, what are you doing here? You know, <laughs> so that was my one experience with an art class. I, I would like to do more. But yeah, I, you know, I, I've started to collect some art. My, my best friend's father was a, was a collector and he passed away and left me a few pieces. Um, mm. So that was sort of the beginning of my, of my collection. And I think. To our earlier point of, you know, trying to create like cumulative wellness, I just find that having nice things on, on my walls like really, really, really improves my mental health. I mean, it's, 100%. it's helpful for me. Yeah. So so I'm, I, I have a few things I need to frame, but it's all coming together. My girlfriend worked as someone looking after plants in and around London. And so we just accumulated all these plants. And so just there you just go. Everywhere. It's the same thing. It's nice. It helps your brain. Yeah, yeah. It helps your brain. Yeah. Goes well with your orange amp. Big. Did you like it? <laughs> I love it. It's so it's, it was broken. Um, but there was like a mini cube squire amp. And I was like, well, if I put that, uh-huh. if I put like the head, I don't think you can see it, but you put the head and I kind of just like yeah. dr- drilled it so sketchily in and it works, <laughs> but it just kind of sounds like shit, which is actually awesome. <laughs> so I mean, that, you know, sounding like shit and sounding awesome are like, you know, it's right there. Next They're inches other. apart. It's like love and hate, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's you know, true. sometimes the most like broken, disgusting sounding things are actually quite gorgeous. You know? It's true. It's true. That's profound. That's a profound way to end the, end the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Holden. I really appreciate the time. Thank you. It's such a nice chat. So there he was, Holden Delwater Gap here on 101 Part-Time Jobs. Hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please leave a review or a rating. Subscribe to the show and get notified as and when more of these brilliant guests come on the show. Later on this week, we got Cooler Shaker, Crispy and Mills, singer of the legendary British band. And next week, Citizen and A Savage to tune in. Don't miss it. Thanks for joining him. Ta-ta. Hey guys, it is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun too. It's a thing. And now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere and each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW group. Void prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.